Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Henry George School. Uh, tonight, we are beginning a new series on Theodore Roosevelt. And as you can see on Ed's screen, uh, the title is Theodore Roosevelt's conflicting, Conflicted Legacy. Now, you may notice a slight difference with what we have posted. We call it the life and legacy, but you are not in the wrong room. Uh, it's the same event. And uh, we are going to let Ed step in and uh, start the class. This is going to be a five-session a five course, but it's going to be a bit more intensive than usual. So we will meet on Mondays and evenings, so twice a week. Thank you, Ed. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Ibrahima, and welcome, everyone. Uh, as Ibrahima said, we're trying uh, something different. We're going we're to be meeting tonight and on Wednesdays until we finish uh, through the, the uh, entire lecture series. Um, it's mainly to accommodate the fact that I will be away uh, on travel in October. And so in order to complete this, this series of lectures on Theodore Roosevelt, uh, we've had to schedule it for two times a week. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Of course, this will be recorded. I'm sure Ibrahim will then make it available through the school's website should anyone not be able to attend all the sessions. But uh, Theodore Roosevelt is, is quite the historical figure. Uh, I suspect that you would have to have lived in a cave somewhere not to ever heard of him almost wherever you were born in this world because he's been such a flamboyant you know, personality and certainly a major figure in the history of the United States and the history of other countries as well during the period of time when he served as the president of the United States and in other capacities in government. Um, but his his life is really interesting. And I was fortunate enough to, to read a couple really good detailed biographies and do some other research based on Theodore Roosevelt's involvement with reform measures throughout his, his life. And in some sense, that brought him in touch with the uh, supporters of Henry George's ideas and the single tax. So we're going to explore all of that in this presentation. And uh, the end result, I hope you'll agree with me that he has quite the legacy and it is in some respects conflicted by uh, just the way, way things worked out and his own belief system and what he was trying to accomplish uh, when he became a, a national and international figure. Please interrupt me if you have questions or comments, as is always the case uh, in our lectures, there are people who are listening who may have already uh, looked at some of this information and have some insights that I haven't picked up. And so share your, your thoughts with me and with everyone. You know, feel free to do so. Just indicate that you'd like to be recognized by, by going to the reaction function in Zoom and raise your yellow hand and uh, either Ibrahim or I will, will acknowledge you and, and bring you into the conversation. One other request I have, uh, if someone with a good New York accent would be interested and willing to uh, take the role of Theodore Roosevelt, wherever there is quoted material from him and be the reader, I think that would add, it's add some, some uh, interesting dynamic to the, to the presentation. Uh, my, my accent would, would not do him justice for, for sure. Okay, so let's talk about his life. Um, well, there's a photograph of him at age 11. And I start off by saying that anyone who has taken a few courses in U.S. history will remember that Roosevelt suffered as a young child from a severe problem with asthma. And this was an illness he worked to overcome in order to build physical strength and stamina. So he was, as a young person, he was very physically active and trying to build up his body so that he uh, could fulfill his ambitions. He was born on the 27th of October in 1858. This is a photograph of the family home in New York City. Um, Theodore was the second of four children, but because of his illness, he was homeschooled by tutors and by his parents. 
So he really didn't have a lot of early association with other young children. In 1876, he was admitted to Harvard College. And there he studied biology. He emerged from that uh, course of study as a naturalist with a lot of interest in nature and eventually in conservation, as, as we'll discuss. He also became editor of the Harvard Advocate, and he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, Kappa in 1880. He ranked 22nd out of a class of 177 students. You can see here's the photograph of him with a little arrow next to him with uh, Theodore with his long sideburns. He had an inheritance from his family of, of what in today's money would be about $2 million. Not a way, bad way to start off your life. Um, he moved into his family home after graduating from college and started to work on a law degree at Columbia Law School. However, um, studying the law was less exciting to him than the possibility of engaging in politics. Already, he had decided to run for office, and he ran as a Republican for a seat in the New York State Assembly. And, and in that campaign, he defeated the machine candidate. Um, so elected, he drops out of law school. And uh, along the way, he meets and marries Alice Hathaway in 1880, uh, a daughter also named Alice, Alice Lee, was born on the 12th of February in 1884. Uh, then just two days later, his wife died of kidney failure. I don't have any more information on the circumstances, if it had anything to do with delivering her young daughter, but, but I suspect that it was closely related. So Theodore, during this period, uh, he's, he's in the New York State Assembly, but he's also researching uh, the history of the War of 1812. And he decides to turn it into a book project, which is published in 1882 uh, with good reviews. He was a thorough researcher, um, uh, willing to go out of his way to find sources that others perhaps would ignore. And the book uh, actually was well received. While he's in office, he joins in a legislative investigation into the corruption of the New York City government. Now, this is still the era of Tammany Hall and great you know, power. Um, those of you who are New Yorkers, uh, you have a more intimate uh, history of this period than I would able to offer. Um, I might be able to offer you a little bit of that history with regard to Philadelphia, but certainly this is the era of machine politics and New York City has already a long history by this time of machine politics and all of this that's involved. And Theodore Roosevelt is very much uh, interested in cleaning up government. He successfully challenges an effort by the financier Jay Gould to have his taxes lowered. And he pushes for an investigation of Gould's influence on one of the judges, a Judge Theodore Westbrook. So uh, that brings him to the fore of reformers in New York City, and certainly not to the favor of the, um, the class of financiers that Jay Gould is a member of. But the public finds Theodore Roosevelt's work uh, worthy of support. He's elected in 1882 for a second term, and he emerges as the Republican Party's leader in the state assembly. Um, and he's he's a maverick already in another another way. Um, um, New York's not the South, but New York is still uh, subject to a, the level of racism that many of the rest of the country exhibited at this period of time. Um, even if on the surface it might have been less uh, in your face kind of racism. But at the 1884 Republican National Convention, Roosevelt supports an African-American named John R. Lynch to uh, chair the convention. 
Lynch was the son of an Irish immigrant and an enslaved woman living in Louisiana. Uh, although his father purchased John's freedom shortly before his death in 1849, John was sold to a white plantation owner in Mississippi, where he remained until the war ended. After emancipation, uh, John became involved in Republican Party politics, and he was appointed a justice of the peace. In the 1869 election, he won a seat in the Mississippi State House of Representatives. This, this is the afterwar period when, when many Blacks were able to rise above their circumstances and get elected to public office. And at the 1884 convention, Lynch actually delivered a keynote speech. And that speech, quote, making him the only African-American accorded such an honor at a national convention until 1968. Let you think about that for just a second. I mean, it's a long period where we have struggled as a nation to come to terms with the way that certain people have been treated by the dominant majority and by the political class as well. And Roosevelt, uh, to his credit, um, had some ideas that were progressive and were based on his feeling of fairness with people. Well, putting aside for a moment his political uh, aspirations, Theodore decides to take up ranching in North Dakota. Um, a lot of this has to do with his desire for physical health and the experience of living it, living the way a uh, uh, an American is supposed to live in his mind, not being a city boy, but being out there in the land, experiencing the land. While he's in North Dakota, he organizes area ranchers to address their shared problems, including overgrazing. And so his commitment to conservation is developing by this personal experience. In 1886, he is appointed a deputy sheriff in Billings County, North Dakota. And it looks like he might remain there for some period of time, but unfortunately, a severe winter destroyed his herd of cattle. Uh, this, was, this is a photograph of the site where his ranch existed. Uh, so he lost most of what he had invested, and he was forced to return to New York City. Not everything is, is negative, though. He meets and marries for the second time. In 1886, he marries a woman named Edith Carroll, um, and they had known each other since childhood, and their marriage would eventually produce five children. So let me just stop there and ask if there are any questions or any comments so far on his early you know, life. Okay. Now, Republican leaders in New York City saw him as a rising star, and they recruited him to run for mayor of the city against Henry George, who was the United Labor Party candidate, and Abram Hewitt, candidate of the Democratic Party. In that election, Roosevelt finished third behind Henry George. Um, and I'm sure someone here can tell me what the newspapers said after the election about Henry George's votes. No good Georgia historians in the crowd tonight. Ibrahima, do you have a thought on this? Well, uh, that uh, George uh, took the lead over TDR, but that the election itself was stolen. The other, the other observation was, I guess it was the New York Times. I don't remember the paper. It could have been the Post, whatever. That that um, Henry George came in second behind Abram Hewitt, uh, and a good deal of his votes were floating down the Hudson River. So, so there was, there, the, the, the political machinery had told Henry George in advance, there's no way that you can win this election, no matter how many votes that you get. 
they actually tried to bribe him by offering him the opportunity to go to Congress. And George said in response to the Tammany Hall leader, um, you know, you made me feel comfortable because I really don't want to be mayor of New York City. And the Tammany Hall rep said, but George, if you run, you're going to raise hell. And he says, well, then I'm intended to run because I do want to raise hell. Well, uh, George had campaigned for just one month, yet he spoke to crowds all around the city again and again, uh, accepting the nomination of the United Labor Party at Cooper Union. Here's what he told supporters. He said, I believe, and I have long believed, that through politics was the way and the only way by which anything real and permanent could be secured for labor. In that path, however, I did not expect to tread. That, I thought, would devolve upon others. But when the secretary of this nominating convention came to me and said, quote, you are the only man upon whom we can unite, and I want you to write me a letter either accepting or refusing to accept it and giving your reasons, that put a different face on the matter. And so George ran, and of course, George's supporters um, were trying to get Roosevelt to at least understand what Henry George's campaign was all, all about. Let me go back. So in a response to a letter Roosevelt received from a group of Henry George's supporters, here's what Theodore had to say about his positions. Um, and here again, uh, is anyone interested in being, being Theodore Roosevelt for this lecture tonight? Marty Rowland, I, there's a New Yorker. I'm sure that Marty can handle this job uh, quite well. Yeah, I can uh, speak for Teddy. Well, here's your first, uh, first oh. quote. <clears throat> Can't hear you, Marty. Yeah, I, I don't see anything. Oh, you don't see anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I forgot. I failed to advance the slide. My my fault. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. The mass of the American people are most emphatically not in the deplorable condition of which you speak. And the statesmen and patriots of today are no more responsible for some people being poor than others than they are for some people being shorter or more nearsighted or physically weaker than others. And it gives you some insight into Roosevelt's feeling that America is the land of opportunity and he still feels it's very much a land of equal opportunity or nearly equal opportunity. He goes on. If you had any conception of the true American spirit, you would know we do not have classes at all on this side of the water. For example, you say, I belong to the landlord class, whereas in reality, I own no land at all except that on which I myself live. Now, remember, he did have a ranch out in the Dakotas. Now, I don't, I don't remember if he leased that land or, or bought it outright, but uh, when his herd failed, he got rid of the ranch and came back came back east, but uh, it shows a little bit of naivete there. And he finishes up with this. Whoops. Go ahead, Marty. Okay. Some of the evils of which you complain are real and can be to a certain degree remedied, remedied but not by the remedies you propose. Others are imaginary and others, though real, can only be gotten over through that capacity for study individual self-help, which is the glory of every true American and can no more be done away with by legislation than you could do away with the bruises which you receive when you tumble down by passing an act to repeal the laws of gravitation. Now, at this point, it's unclear in, in his biographies or anything that I've been able to find that he ever actually read anything by Henry George. Uh, or or anything by any of George's main supporters, perhaps except, you know, what he saw in the newspapers. So 
Uh, it's hard to say if he's just uh, reaching conclusions based on a vague understanding of what George is, is talking about, um, which is kind of unusual, again, because he's a serious student. He's someone who studies issues and uh, studies them seriously. And that's that's evident by his next project. And here's the, the outcome of that project. It was a uh, actually a five volume work titled The Winning of the West. So he loses the election uh, to Abram Hewitt and he has this in mind to start a new project. And he comes out with the first two volumes of The Winning of the West um, in 1889. Um, in 1896, probably the most famous historian of the period, Frederick Jackson Turner, reviewed the fourth and final volume, which appeared in the October issue of the American Historical Review. And Turner says he thought the author had done, quote, a real service to our history. He goes on to say, he, Roosevelt, has received a whole movement in American development, I'm not sorry, has rescued a whole movement in American development from the hands of unskilled analysts. He has made use of widely scattered original sources, not heretofore exploited, and with graphic vigor, he has portrayed the advance of the pioneer into the wastes of the continent. Um, and all true, but where's the analysis of the consequences? You know, that's, that's part of what Theodore is coming to in terms of conservation once he sees the consequences of this rapid development, the rapid movement of, of millions of people into the frontier and exploiting the natural resources without much thought to the future, that's when his conscience starts to rise and with, re, with regard to the need for somehow conserving this, these resources for future generations. So Benjamin Harrison, uh, elected in 1888, appoints Roosevelt to the United States Civil Service Commission. And here, uh, Theodore takes his responsibilities pretty seriously. He fought hard for enforcement of civil service laws. And so as evidence of his commitment to principles over politics, he gets reappointed in 1892, not by Benjamin Harrison, but by the new president, Grover Cleveland, who was a Democrat. His next challenge comes in 1894. He accepts the appointment to the board of the New York City Police Commissioners, and he is selected as the board's president. Um, I'm sure that many of you uh, watched the television series Blue Bloods and uh, the com police commissioner uh, of the New York City Police Department, his office behind his desk is a photograph of none other than Theodore Roosevelt. And, and so that just gives you a sense of the legacy that Roosevelt left to the city because it was his uh, desire to make the police department a professional police department, looking after citizens' rights and protecting, and protecting the citizens. Whereas the police department up to that period of time had a fairly checkered uh, history. Of, of graft and corruption and mis, mis abuse of power, et cetera, as is, is unfortunately often uh, brought in the discussions today about, about police, police systems in different cities in the United States and, of course, in other countries. So Roosevelt was committed to, to doing the job that he was hired to do. Um, he was also possessed of a, a real growing social conscience, particularly after reading the book, How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rees. Roosevelt became an active proponent of efforts to improve the living conditions of the city's poor immigrants. Um, the photographs of life in New York slums presented in Rees's book, a powerful indictment of the American system. Uh, one review at the time could not have escaped the attention of Henry George or at least some of his, his supporters. And that review said of, of the book by Reese, 
Greed and reckless selfishness are given as the chief cause of this evil, for the keeping of tenements is generally a speculation and a very paying one to judge by the evidence given at various official inquiries. The landlords of New York are to be found in every stratum of society. The property of absentees is left in the hands of agents whose instructions are collect the rent in advance or failing, eject the occupants. And it is a common saying in New York that evictions are as frequent there as in Ireland. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about that. About that. Um, for those of you who are, who are lifelong New Yorkers, um, living you know, in New York City, dealing with landlords, if you're a tenant, uh, perhaps you have some sort of uh, comparative experience that you uh, would, would think appropriate to, to balance here with what was happening in 1900. Yes, ho hopefully things have changed and improved. Uh, Marty and Tom. Oh, okay, well, I'll go first. Uh, so I was just reflecting on the uh, the conference that we just had with the Henry George School and the talk. I can't remember the, the woman's name, but she was showing how uh, during the COVID period where landlords were, um, well, there's a corporate landlordism was ripe. And uh, you, sh you saw the the, as soon as they they bought up large amounts of individual units and uh, single family homes, that's when the, the eviction rate started. When the, it became more of a business, so so I, I would imagine that things haven't really changed too much. Well, I I know from my own research that that there are about at least the National Low Income Housing Coalition says there's a shortage of over 7 million affordable housing units, uh, rental housing units in the United States. And that number is probably uh, higher now since uh, since the COVID experience. Uh, so obviously, when we have a, su a, uh, a supply shortage and um, the opportunity to convert um, any kind of uh, tenant occupied housing into into a uh, higher rental the landlords if they can get away with it under the law unless they have an extraordinarily good um, conscience and commitment to social justice are going to take advantage of that Tom did you want to say something uh yeah just what one observation is that um you know he not only you know he forged a great relationship with Jacob Reese and and they used to go he used to dress up in in um, in disguise and and travel around with Jacob Rees to the Lower East Side at night, and not just to experience the police corruption because a lot of police at that time were on the take and they were in bars instead of at their posts and all that. Right. Um, but but also you know just to just to see for themselves, um, you know, to, for for Teddy to experience for himself how these people were living. And you know, and and the and the intense poverty and 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 the the deprivation that people were living in. And the other question I had was, um, or the question I had, I guess, the first question, um, did is there any documentation on on Teddy Roosevelt's uh, view of of Henry George, and if you ever read Progress and Poverty or um, Social Problems or any of the other books? I. Did he eventually ever read Henry George? I'm not sure, but yes, he did express his opinion of Henry George, and and I have a quote from from him on on George a little bit later. But um, it's a it's a um, from from what I read in the biographies and getting more information on Roosevelt coming out of issues of the public edited by Louis Post. Um, there's a lot more detail there um, that I'm actually slowly discovering now as I work through the issues of the post as a as a project. Some of you might know I've been I've been going through uh, this weekly newspaper, which began publication in 1898, and it it continued up until 1919. Um, and 
I'm up through, I'm up into 19, the 1912 issues now, and almost every issue uh, has some discussion of Roosevelt's politics and, and to some extent, his interaction with, with key players in the single tax movement within the United States. So, so there is, there, there's a relationship there, um, but I, I can't, find a speech where Theodore Roosevelt actually comes out in favor of the taxation of land values or the single tax. But maybe I'll find something as I continue working through the public. When? The three things. Uh, the line that, that uh, the landlords of New York are to be found in every stratum of society. Uh, one of the top stratums might be the um, Trinity Wall Trinity Episcopal Church on on Wall Street, <sighs> and um, I know by 1895 that, that they were among among the landlords of, of of tenements. There was a series of articles in the New York Times in 18 October, November, maybe December of 1894 or five, um, just one every day, and they they were they're quite explicit. Uh, second thing, the cha charity organization review there. Uh, charity organization was still around in 1925, uh, and I'm only aware of it because two of the people that Robert Schockenbach appointed to the original board were uh, active, were, had roles in that. And uh, one was, Jay, I think was James J. Murphy, and, and he was uh, head of something related to tenements. And the other uh, was Lawson Purdy, who in in the, 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 the tens uh, or aughts was was uh, assessor in New York City, and and he was primarily responsible for a uh, a ten year abatement on new construction values, as I recall, that that caused it, it brought about a major boom in new construction in New York City. All those pre-war buildings that are are in, still quite in demand. Ah. Yeah. Uh, and then the third thing, uh, around 1911, uh, Teddy Roosevelt would give a speech that's that, that a page or, or two of it sounded quite Georgist. I, I think it was the new nationalism, but it, 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 Henry George could have written it. Yeah, this is. I mean. Uh, my understanding is that eventually he did uh, become far more of a, an advocate of free trade and tax reform, but um, that, that particular speech, I forget if I have a quote from it or not. I don't think I do. Um, but do you recall if he actually referred to the taxation of land values in that speech? I don't remember. Okay. But, uh, I, I mean... Go. By the way, I, sh I should tell everyone, if you're interested in more of the details here, and I've been putting a lot of, of, uh, of the information that I've uncovered onto my School of Cooperative Individualism website in the biographical history section. So if you went there and looked in the U.S. listing under Teddy Roosevelt, you'd see a lot of this new information slowly coming through. So, so you know, maybe over the next couple of days, the, uh, as we get through the early part of the lectures, and I might be able to do it, go in and actually do a little bit more research and and see if uh, if I can find out exactly what he did say. But in a long article that he uh, had published in McClure's magazine in 1901, he actually credits Jacob Reese with shedding bright light on the problems of the large cities. Uh, he says in that article uh, this. Marty, you want to take that? Yeah, okay. The countless evils which lurk in the dark corners of our civic institutions, which stalk abroad in the slums and have their permanent abode in the crowded tenement houses have met in Mr. Reese, the most formidable opponent ever encountered by them in New York City. To Mr. Reese was given, in addition to earnestness and zeal, the great gift of expression. 
the great gift of making others see what he saw and feel what he felt. Yeah, and so there, there's another avenue for potential research to see if Jacob Reese ever had any ongoing uh, acquaintanceship with the single taxers in New York City um, or had ever written specifically about Henry George. That I have not attempted to find out. But it's just there's just so much opportunity here for historians to dig deeper into these stories than they usually do. So you know, let's hope that some more work is done in that area by some some people who can go into the archives even deeper than I have. Well, Roosevelt campaigned for William McKinley during the 1896 presidential election. Um, he really wanted William Jennings Bryan to be defeated. Um, he opposed Bryan's call for bimetallism. Bimetallism was the desire to introduce both silver and gold as backing for, for money. And, uh, and Roosevelt describes Bryan's followers, of whom single taxers were pretty numerous, as dangerous fanatics. Um, Bryan, however, made his case for his ideas at the Democrat, Democratic Party's national convention. And here's what Brian had to say in that campaign. There are two ideas of government. There are those who believe that if you will only legislate to make the well-to-do prosperous, their prosperity, prosperity will leak through on those below. The democratic idea, however, has been that if you legislate to make the masses prosperous, their prosperity will find its way up through every class which rests upon them. And he adds, you come to us and tell us that the great cities are in favor of the gold standard. We reply that the great cities rest upon our broad and fertile prairies. Burn down your cities and leave our farms, and your cities will spring up again as if by magic. But destroy our farms, and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. So a very strong statement that it is the rural population and the work of the people in the rural population that make the cities actually possible. What do you think about Brian's position there, his, his comment, comments? Any, any, <clears throat> anyone have any specific uh, reaction to him? Well, I, for, this is Marty. The first uh, comment that came to my mind was this uh, concept of trickle-down economics. It's one that uh, has has been uh, uh, foisted on us over and over again over the years, uh, particularly in the 80s when uh, when Reagan came into power in our country. So uh, curious about other thoughts about that. Thank you. Trickle-down economic ideas have been with us for a very long time, <laughs> and particularly those who are privileged in society tend to have them and have confidence in them. Marty. Yeah, well, I guess what uh, what this uh, quote says to me is that in that period of time, um, uh, protectionism was still a thing, and there was a uh, uh, connection between the rural and the cities. Whereas later on, uh, the hmm. people owning large uh, farms could uh, uh, get grain from wherever they can all over the world, and you know we uh, we got the system that you know looked at uh, NAFTA and other types of trade arrangements where you could make that separate. But here we're seeing that there was a, a strong link between rural and the city. Dependency. The, what he's arguing, what William Jennings Bryan is arguing, is that the cities are dependent upon, you know, the rural countryside. And if you think about it, back in you know 19, 1900, uh, there were very few suburbs. There, were, I mean, suburbs practically didn't exist. So you know, uh, there were far, farmland all around every major city. So. Food was grown locally and delivered into the cities, um, and it was a symbiotic relationship. But what you're talking about, Marty, is that there's been a there's been something of a disconnect now. We yeah. stopped we stopped thinking about the land around the cities as as providing the goods, the agricultural goods in particular, 
that, that the cities require. Those goods can come from anywhere because yeah. we, we have a, the transportation systems that we've established. But, um, you know, Roosevelt could have been thinking also as well uh, later, um, well, what happens if the irrigation, you know, that we need to grow wheat in the West is no longer available? What happens if the Colorado River uh, no longer produces sufficient water to irrigate uh, California and the Midwest? Um, and we have gobbled up the land around our cities and turned them into uh, suburban communities and bedroom communities. I, I don't know if, if, if Roosevelt thought that far ahead but but certainly i think that's that's a concern we have these days and and if roosevelt was alive today uh i suspect that he would he would have those same concerns in terms of of how we have allowed our cities to expand and sprawl over the countryside gobbling up the most fertile lands uh that could be used for food production yeah i thought that was a very good uh, uh analysis that you did uh, I guess one of the things I'd add is that nowadays uh, these rural or the people that are like in the way are called deplorables and uh, they get away with it. Well, uh, we shall see what happens. It, it, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm not a, I'm not someone who's opposed to planning. I do believe in the market system but I've always been someone who supports getting people around the table to discuss how they would like to see their communities uh, develop in the future and how they should be planned. So that we're all stakeholders in this. And uh, I'm not so sure that, that um, market dynamics can come up with the right solutions to these, these challenges without a lot of intellectual input from, from people. But let me go on in, into Roosevelt's story. Uh, we could we could have a long discussion on on where our cities are going to go in the next couple of decades, given the, the pressures that are on them right now. But McKinley rewards Roosevelt now with an appointment as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897, and from this position, Roosevelt pushes for an increases in the nation's naval strength. He also pressed McKinley to take action against the Spanish in Cuba, and he provided his views on the nation's idea of manifest destiny in the Caribbean and the Pacific. And this is where Roosevelt begins to get become in conflict with those in the country who do not agree that the United States should be expanding its reach across the world. Um, in an article that's published in March of 1896 in the issue of a publication called The Bachelor of Arts, Roosevelt defends the Monroe Doctrine as, quote, a broad general principle of living policy. And he adds this. Marty? Yeah, sure. The Monroe Doctrine may be briefly defined as forbidding European encroachment on American soil. The United States has not the slightest wish to establish a universal protectorate over other American states or become responsible for their misdeeds. And perhaps not, but uh, the 20th century tells somewhat different story, does it not? Well, mm -hmm. at the time, Roosevelt's desires, they come to fruition with the USS Maine exploding while it's anchored in the harbor of Havana, Cuba. Um, there's, everyone knows some of that story. Um, did it? Did the boiler simply blow up, or was it was was it sabotage? Um, the historians, I guess, are still debating that. But without any orders from the president, Roosevelt orders a squadron to Cuba, um, assuming the worst that this is an action by the Spanish, and war does erupt in April, and now Roosevelt. Being Roosevelt, resigns his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and he began to form a new regiment, and the press gave the, his regiment the name the Rough Riders. And here's a photograph of the Rough Riders before they uh, embarked on their journey to Cuba. The Rough Riders arrive in Cuba on the 23rd of June. 
Roosevelt is promoted to colonel and he takes command. At the Battle of Kettle Hill, the Rough Riders force the Spanish to abandon their positions and they secure a major famous victory for Roosevelt. In his autobiography, Roosevelt reflects on the reasons the United States was ill-prepared going, going into this war with Spain. Um, he, he says as follows. Marty. There are nations who only need to have peaceful ideals inculcated and to whom militarism is a curse and a misfortune. There are other nations like our own so happily situated that the thought of war is never present to the minds. There are wholly free from, or they are wholly free from any tendency improperly to exalt or to practice militarism. Our people are not military. We need normally only a small standing army, but there should be behind it a reserve of instructed men big enough to fill it up to full strength, uh, to full war strength, which is over twice the peace, peace strength. So he's, he's you know, he, his belief is that the United States is a peaceful society. Uh, we're not interested in dominating other people by military force or military means. And so ordinarily we should only have a small standing army. Um, but uh, events would really change the course of history for the United States, no doubt. For Roosevelt, he is now a national figure as a result of his, his activities in Cuba, his successful military campaign. It kind of reminded me of Winston Churchill when he came back from the Boer War and he gets elected to Parliament, you know, as a young man. Well, Roosevelt in the United States has a similar, you know, welcoming, uh, a hero from the, from the uh, conflict. And not only that, but he's getting attention for his views. So he gets an opportunity to express his views on a lot of the political issues of the day. Um, in an article that was published in the September 1896 issue of the Review of Reviews, he discussed the role of the vice president. And as, as you all know, in the United States, for most of the history of the vice presidency, the vice presidency was thought to be and you know, I just uh, not a very important position with not very much responsibility given. And uh, oftentimes the president and vice president hardly even met. And certainly that was the case when uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had Harry S. Truman as his vice president. And, you know, the story about, about Franklin dies and Truman has no idea that there is this uh, weapon weapons program called the atomic bomb. So anyway, here's here's what Roosevelt says, Theodore Roosevelt says about the vice presidency. The presidency being all important and the vice presidency of comparatively little note, the entire strength of the contending factions is spent in the conflict over the first. And very often a man who is most anxious to take the first place will not take the second, preferring some other political position. It has thus frequently happened that the two candidates have been totally dissimilar in character and even in party principle, though both running on the same ticket. Very odd results have followed in more than one instance. And a, a good case being made just by his statement here that um, that there needs to be a much different relationship between the candidates who are running as president and vice president on the same ticket. Um, so I'm going to end tonight's lecture there. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for some discussion. So if you have any questions on what we covered so far tonight uh, or comments, Want to share any any views and information? Let's take the last ten minutes to do so. Ibrahima, did you want to join in? Uh, yes, I'm here at listening. I do not have a question right now, but uh, I have been muted. I have given everybody the possibility to unmute themselves. So if you have questions, go ahead.
Michael. Hello, Michael. Hello. Good, good, good evening to everyone. Oh, good, good. It's, it's, it's almost morning now here. <laughs> uh, can, can I ask a quick go back to the comment on housing? Um, you, you, you speak about rental housing in, in New York. It, it, um, in, in England, we, we have problems with re renting and council housing and affordable housing. Was rental housing in America wholly in the private sector or, or did they have um, you know, other, other types of um, you know, uh, you know, government oh, uh, housing, et cetera, et cetera? Um, it began to become uh, a responsibility of the public sector right about the time that we've been talking about. As a result of the investigations of people like Jacob Rees and there are others uh, Lincoln Steffens, the major reformer in the United States, wrote about the tragedy of the living in, in, in life in the cities and the, the terrible housing stock and slums and all that. So right about this time, there's a major impetus for civic reform and, re and to clean up, begin the process of cleaning up the cities. Uh, but um, but a lot of the housing is owned by um, absentee owners. Um, you know, Landlordism, in fact. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> for example, in New York City, you have this process where parts of the city that had been once the uh, places of residence for very well-to-do and even middle, even middle income households were slowly being abandoned to uh, or converted into tenements as people wanted to leave the city to move away from the stench, move away from the factories. So now when you have the beginnings of commuter rail systems to, to get you out of the city, but you can get back in the city in a short period of time for your workplace, um, you have the, this process of, of those who are able to do so will begin to move away uh, from, the, from those parts of the cities that traditionally have been manufacturing and and used for other purposes. Um, there's, you know, all water. You know the story in, in in English cities. You know the problems with sewage systems and and water treatment facilities. All of that around the beginning of the 20th century were becoming serious social issues, yeah. and the um, media at the time was was beginning to expose the conditions and developing the the public support to do something about it through government yeah. involvement i think it's a very interesting area really because it, nowadays it, it, i don't know what it's like in america but in england everyone associates it, associates affordable housing with council housing that the government had to supply etc cetera, etc cetera. but the, you draw my attention to the fact that, that perhaps it's uh, every property is now becoming Certainly, here in England, rental property is is spanning a very wide area of uh, of, of, of of supply. All private uh, private houses are being rented out. So, the rent, you know, the rental regime, as it were, is becoming the normal, whether it's government or or, or private, etc., and very high rents. So, in fact. It, people are trapped in a, in a in a rental situation i don't know what it's like no, i often just i i use this analysis in the united states of uh poor people in rural areas who are moving into the cities they basically left a life where they were tenant farmers or sharecroppers to become urban sharecroppers and in a sense, convert giving over a good deal of their whatever wages they were earning living in the city to a landowner in return for, uh, you know, just the, the ability to occupy a space that was that hardly met, you know, the definition of, of minimum human standards. So uh, all of that was going on at the time, and it and it's certainly going on now in our in our modern times. And the question in the political arena seems to be what is the obligation of society to do anything about it and those who tend to be on the conservative side 
and to think it is a function best served by public, private interests and others on uh, the left tend to think that, that the community, the government has a moral uh, and social responsibility and obligation to provide decent, affordable housing for all. Mm. Uh, thanks very much. That's, that's in interesting. Marty. Yeah, I'd like to uh, raise my hand if nobody else is chomping at the bit. Uh, so I did want to share some experience that I had in New Orleans uh, after Katrina, actually before Katrina, uh, I belonged to a social justice group that was advocating the, the saving of the public housing and uh, learned that uh, I think half of the, the public housing uh, was originally for white tenants only. And then they had other ones that were for African-Americans. And eventually it became all African-Americans. But it was interesting that they 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 put a little bit better effort in the 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 white uh, houses, but you know they all kind of look the same with the uh, the bricks and such. But it's interesting that they had copper uh, flashings, uh, which I imagine were quite uh, tempting for people to rip off. But um, so that was kind of like the the history of uh, um, of the housing is that it was all from the federal government. Uh, during the FDR times. Uh, then Katrina happened, and I think most people uh, know the story about how the uh, the politicians of every stripe worked as hard as they could to make sure that the, the residents, the poor African-American residents, never moved back, and they succeeded pretty well. They converted what the, the housing that was there into... Uh, a private partner, a uh, private public partnership. And uh, in the politics of the time, we we thought that now that Obama was president 2008, uh, that something would change, but uh, we soon found that uh, no different than, uh, you know, George Bush. Uh, but I do want to add one thing. Uh, I, I really think that you're doing a good job on this, uh, this course, because what we're seeing is uh, the George element uh, within the the mainstream politics, you know, focusing on on Theodore and uh, seeing where maybe opportunities were missed. Uh, so I think it's a it's a great uh, course that you're doing. Well, thanks, Marty. Uh, researching Theodore Roosevelt was a joy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I I obviously knew a good deal about his life, but. Uh, as anyone who does bi biographical research uh, can tell you, you learn a, an enormous amount about a person uh, through his co correspondence. What did he write to his friends or enemies? Uh, what do people put in letters? I, I'm always real interested to read uh, correspondence that people engage in. Marty Levin. You're muted, Marty. Trying to get my mouse to, to behave. Um, so I, one of the things I'm curious about is uh, when the uh, experience of uh, rent control came into effect in New York City, because I know that that has impacted a lot of people who are, you know, it, uh, if you have an apartment that you're only paying $300 or $400 a month for, and if you were to move to a new place, it might cost four or five times that amount. Um, well, it, it has an impact first on the landlords, but it also has effect, an effect on the tenants. And uh, I don't think there are that many cities around the country that, that have the kind of rent control that uh, New York has in place. And I'm just curious how that tied in with some of the research that you've been doing. Well, I don't, ha I don't have the, the dates in my fingertips, but I can tell you just generally from, from my work on affordable housing uh, in my career is that the movement for federal involvement in, in uh, affordable housing began with the Great Depression. Before, uh, before the Great Depression, it was very difficult to get a long-term uh, fixed rate mortgage loan. In other words, if you were buying a house, um, you would get a, maybe a five-year loan that had a balloon payment at the end, and you would have to refinance. So if circumstances changed, 
interest rates went up, you lost employment, you were more than likely going to be uh, out on, on your own. So there were massive foreclosures during the Great Depression and, um, and a lot of uh, people homeless. So the federal government uh, established different programs, a com combination for building uh, uh, rental occupancy, affordable rental occupancy properties that would be subject to um, income limits and subject to controls over, over what rents would be charged. And that program, those programs really continued and grew up through the early 1970s. And then we started to see resistance to, to those programs. And for example, rent control was replaced by rent stabilization in many cities. And the argument for rent stabilization over rent control is pretty simple that, um, if you keep the rents too artificially low, there's not a rev enough revenue to take care of the building. And so the build building owners, if it's a privately owned building, tend to not keep up with maintenance, uh, don't repair systems when they need to be repaired or replaced. And eventually what, what happens in too many cases, which did happen in too many cases, is the, the, the owners milk the buildings for cash for as much cash flow as possible and wait for the community to come along and put a, a evict the, the occupants and put up put up uh, you know barriers to entry and say this building is now condemned and it sits there for years and years and years until something's happened it's either torn down or eventually makes its way back into the housing stock. So I mean this is a long terrible story uh, of of the situation of rental housing in America and I suspect. In, in other countries, you know, uh, Michael was talking about, you know, England, I'm sure other countries have the same experience with uh, the problem of, main, of, of meeting the demand as population grows for permanently affordable housing, given the, the increase in costs of actually maintaining the buildings. I don't, you know, others may have, may have some experience you want to share on and that score as well. But we definitely need, as I said, the National Home uh, Low Income Housing Coalition says we need at least seven, 7 million more af affordable housing units. And there are ways to get there, but it's going to require considerable public subsidy given the high cost of land that, that, that exists in, in all the communities where the need is the greatest. Well, we're three minutes past 7.30. Uh, we wanted to limit these sessions to an hour so it wouldn't take up your whole evening. Um, so uh, if anyone has a last comment or question we'll, before we break tonight, if not, we'll see you all hopefully on Wednesday at the same time. Thank you very much, uh, Ed. Thank you all for uh, attending and we look forward to seeing you again on Wednesday. Good night. Thanks, Ed. Bye now. Thank Enjoy. Bye-bye.